He thinks that the cordyceps in Ellie has grown with her since birth. Why is she in surgery? It produces a kind of chemical messenger. It makes normal cordyceps think that she's cordyceps. It's why she's immune. He's going to remove it from her, multiply the cells in a lab, produce those chemical messengers, and then we can give it to everyone. He thinks it could be a cure, Joel. And we know cure. that cordyceps grows in the brain. So this is brain surgery. We're here at last. It's the season finale of The Last of Us. And there is still more mental health stuff to talk about in this very last episode. I've been really surprised about how much I've loved this series. It's so not my usual thing. Kind of sad that it's finishing, at least for now. Before we start, though, a question for the comments below. What do you think is actually happening in our brain when we daydream? And at what point do you think that daydreaming starts to become a problem? Pop your thoughts in the comments. I will check and... Answers may be coming in a video very, very soon. And it is relevant to this episode. Ready? Let's crack on. So we've got a classic scene of a person is shot or killed or stabbed, which is happening about 20 times an episode. And ooh. Oh God. So she's got a newborn baby and- It's not your fault. We were delayed getting out of the zone. I know. She's hungry. She needs to be fed, and I, I didn't want to nurse her. I'll be honest, I'm not even going to attempt to sort of rationalise an academic argument about whether exposure to cordyceps from a bite is going to cross the placenta, because I presume this is feeding into Ellie's origin story about why she's been bitten and somehow immune. I'm a psychiatrist. It's a TV show. In fact, I was thinking maybe I could teach you. I bet you'd be great at it. Mm -hmm. You want to learn how to play guitar? She's not quite herself, is she? Ellie. Hmm? I mean, you wouldn't be oh, when you've yeah. been through what she has in the last episode, particularly. That'd be great. The neuroscience of daydreaming is attributed to a set of structures in the brain called the default mode network. These are interconnected brain structures that span throughout the brain that's thought to control daydreaming, autobiographical memory, conceptualizing the future, all things that are very introspective. When it's activated, we don't focus on the task at hand. Instead, we passively focus our attention inward onto our internal train of thought, completely unrelated to external stimuli. It's then deactivated by deliberate thought or goal-directed activity. For example, there is an external stimulus that's so loud or so prominent that it somehow manages to redirect our attention to it. And then we have to act upon it. Someone yelling on a over and over again, louder and louder and louder. But it still takes a few goes to get the attention, right? Presuming she's never seen a giraffe before. Mm. <laughs> would you not be utterly terrified? <laughs> I would be. Makes me think of the way that we use animal therapy, albeit we've never had giraffes being used as animal therapy. But it's something increasingly seen throughout all of medicine, not just in psychiatry, but also in neurology, in trauma settings, intensive care, care of the elderly for people that often have dementia and other neurodegenerative illnesses. It's all about the multi-sensory stimulation, not just seeing the animal, but hearing the animal, touching the animal, smelling the animal. Imitation, physical contact, play and social interactions, generating uh, feelings of sympathy, feelings of empathy, of care and compassion. All of these things do serve to reduce stress and at least act as a potential healthy bit of distraction. Often at one of the most stressful times of our life if we're stuck in hospital. I know you want to protect me. You have. And when we're done, we'll go wherever you want. Tommy's, Sheep Ranch, the moon. I'll follow you anywhere you go. But there's no halfway with this. We finish what we started. 
there's a lot of risk and uncertainty in what they're doing. Um, we attempt to manage a lot of risk and uncertainty in psychiatry. Is someone going to hurt themselves? Is someone going to hurt someone else? If so, when? In what way? How likely is it? Can we prevent it? And in reality, there's very little science behind risk assessment. It comes down to experience and a bit of a judgment call. We don't really remove any uncertainty, we just try and put that uncertainty into context. There are risk prediction calculators and risk prediction toolkits which do have some evidence base on a population level, i.e. out of X number of people presenting with these symptoms, Y will go on to do a particular act within a particular time frame. But we don't know which individuals that might be. That was the guy who shot and missed. There's no story. Sarah died. And I couldn't see the point anymore. Simple as that. I've spoken a lot about grief on previous episodes, and particularly when we looked at that episode of Scrubs that talked about those five stages, where the emotions are real, but the idea of stages is nonsense. But one of the biggest difficulties for mental health professionals meeting people that are really struggling with grief is at what point is someone's severe experience of grief gone from something expected, proportionate to the situation, albeit really, really, really distressing, where the goal is actually to kind of work through it, versus when is that grief triggering or transitioning into an episode of depression that needs to be treated very differently? So time heals all wounds, I guess. Maybe. It wasn't time that did it. The silence speaks volumes, doesn't it? And diagnostic manuals like the DSM and the ICD have tried to put sp a, a specific time limits on how long it is normal to grieve for. Like if you're grieving for more than six months, it starts to become prolonged grief, which is labelled as an abnormal grief reaction. Or if you haven't started showing visible signs of grief for two weeks, this is a delayed onset grief reaction. I don't agree that there is a normal versus a pathological way to grieve. Everyone's experience of grief is different. The focus should be less about pathologizing grief and trying to distinguish when is grief becoming depression so that we don't undertreat people's depression or over medicalize the concept of grief. People are making apocalypse jokes like there's no tomorrow. Too soon? No, it's topical. <laughs> oh, I love this one. Moon rocks taste better than earth rocks. Why? Because they're meteor. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, that's a, you. That, that was actually good. That's a zero out of all right, ten. All right. We're not only back to the puns, we're back to a significant absence of cheese puns, which I think is one of the biggest flaws in this entire season, if I might add. What did the cheese say when it saw itself in the mirror? Hello, me. What kind of cheese would you use to lure a bear down from a tree? Come on, bear. No? All right. Um, what kind of cheese would you use to obscure a small horse? Mask a pony. I know ponies and horses aren't the same. Don't at me for that. That's going to be the biggest area that I'm going to get comments on this, aren't I? Well, actually, a pony and a horse are very, very different. So this is the bit after he's just been bonked on the back of the head, isn't it? Welcome to the fireflies. Easy. Oh. You got hit pretty hard. A concussion is a type of mild traumatic brain injury. And by mild, I mean that someone's Glasgow coma scale doesn't drop below 13 out of 15. Any loss of consciousness after the injury is less than 30 minutes. And there's no structural damage on the brain visible on an acute scan, i.e. there's no evidence someone is bleeding into their brain. It can cause a range of transient neurocognitive symptoms. So problems with short term memory, confusion, poor coordination, disorientation, changes in sensory sensitivities, most of which will resolve within a few days of rest. In some cases, it can transition into a post-concussion syndrome where these symptoms become milder but much, much more persistent for weeks or months thereafter. Prognostic indicators for recovery after a traumatic brain injury are predominantly the duration of any loss of consciousness and the duration of any post-traumatic amnesia, which can include retrograde amnesia, so difficulties recalling stuff that happened in the lead up to the incident, and anterograde amnesia, so difficulties laying down new memories after the injury. He thinks that the cordyceps anelli has grown with her since birth. Why is she in surgery? It produces a kind of chemical messenger. It makes normal cordyceps think that she's cordyceps, it's why she's immune. He's gonna remove it from her 
multiply the cells in a lab, produce those chemical messengers, and then we can give it to everyone. He thinks it could be a cure, Joel. And we know cure. that cordyceps grows in the brain. So this is brain surgery. Tomophobia is the fancy term for a fear of surgery or fear of some sort of medical intervention. He's experiencing that on her behalf. You can see it by the look on his face. But it's usually one example of a broader fear of the unknown or a fear due to a past negative experience of, you know, going through surgery or a medical intervention or someone you know about going through that. It's particularly common for surgeries involving the vital organs, brain surgery, heart surgery. In fact, the first antipsychotic developed, chlorpromazine, was actually made as a sedating antihistamine to try and settle people's preoperative anxiety before going for surgery back in the 1950s, before they went, actually, this is really effective at trying to calm people down. Maybe this has a role uh, therapeutically, potentially, for people with mental illness where there was little else available at the time. And lo and behold, it was actually a really effective antipsychotic. It does. Find someone else. There is no one else. We didn't tell her, we didn't cause her any fear. There no. won't be any pain. No, you take me to her, you take me to her right now! Oh! Oh! This is sort of replaying the risk of losing his daughter and being unable to intervene and stop it. His daughter died at the hands of someone in a position of authority at the start, right? Kind of seeing the same thing again here. And that sense of helplessness. He's not missing any shots now, is he? Undoing the past mistakes. I wouldn't even actually say it's a mistake. He's just perhaps trying to undo what he couldn't undo before. This is his violent murdery redemption story no matter how hard you try no matter how many people you kill she's gonna grow up joel and then you'll die or she'll leave then what how long till she's torn apart by infected or murdered by raiders because she lives in a broken world that you could have saved maybe but it isn't for you to decide or you so what would she decide huh because I think she'd want to do what's Maybe right. Maybe just ask her? Teenagers can make their own decisions about medical interventions that should then be respected. In the UK, decision-making ability is assessed in those 16 years old or above using the Mental Capacity Act. People are presumed to have capacity unless it's proven that they don't, i.e. the onus is on the professional to prove that someone doesn't have decision-making ability, not on the patient to prove that they do. In those under 16, there is an alternative but related concept called Gillick competence, which is used to assess young people under the age of 16's ability to consent to an investigation or treatment in a medical setting. When a child is competent to make their own decision, it overrides parental consent, unless they're refusing a recommended treatment, where in some cases the parents or the courts can overrule that young person's refusal. Specifically, if by refusing, that young person is likely to experience grave and irreversible mental or physical harm. These situations, thankfully, are rare, and they are emotionally, medically, legally difficult, and they do usually end up going through the courts. What? It's all right, you're with me. Take it slow. The drugs are still wearing off. I was with the fireflies and then... I... What drugs? They were running some tests on you. And some others. Turns out there's a whole lot more like you. Calling all of these statists, is, is that okay? This kind of feels like a um, if a benzo was wearing off, not if a general anaesthetic was wearing off. I only point that out because of my love and respect for anaesthetists, um, because their job is so much more complicated than people give them credit for. Raiders attacked the hospital. I barely got you out of there. We'll find you some new ones on the way. Are people hurt? Yes. Is Marlene okay? Brings up the moral question of whether lying is 
ever okay, particularly when it's not necessarily now to protect someone from immediate danger. Plus, who is the lie benefiting? I.e. is that lie there to alleviate his own guilt? Or is it to protect her from others and arguably protect her from herself, but while at the same time strips away any autonomy and casts some doubt over whether she can really trust the person that so far has been the only constant in her life? Well, Sarah and I used to hike like this all the time. He's saying her name more and more now. I wouldn't say it was her favorite thing. She wasn't a fan of the mosquitoes and such. <laughs> but she was a big climber or scampering. That's probably the right word. It's less avoidance, and that's a, that's a healthy thing. Definitely different kids. How so? Well, she was a lot more, I want to say girly, and I'm not saying that you're not girly. I'm not. Yeah, you're not. Yes, away with the gender norms, without making a big deal of it, because it's about how do we help people be their authentic self. I think she'd like you. Why? Because you're funny. I think you would have made her laugh. Anyway, I bet you would have liked her back. Yeah, bet I would have. He's not separating his past and his present as much as he was, but he's using his present to kind of undo aspects of his past. His past influences present. He's acknowledging these experiences are now much more interlinked than perhaps he was willing to appreciate before. After all, we are a collection of our past experiences. They shape who we are, they shape what we do, whether that is through conscious awareness or through sort of unconscious actions and defenses that come up. I am still shocked at how much I love this season, but I hear there's a season two, so I'm excited. I ain't gonna play the game though, because that's a bridge too far for me, I think. <laughs> Let me know what you thought though in the comments below and I will see you for another video very, very soon. Love you, bye.